Good morning. Welcome again to Christ Community Chapel. My name is Mike, part of the staff here. Uh, if you're here in the sanctuary, tuning in online, welcome. Uh, I lead our community groups here, so I'm excited, pretty jazzed for Ephesians together to get started. So I have an idea for you. Uh, if you are not in a group, grab the person you just met, if you know their name, and uh, jump into a group. Uh, it's a great way to grow and be changed uh, this year, uh, so take advantage. Uh, besides community groups, every now and then I get to stand before you and share God's word. I'm grateful to, to do that today. It was just over one year ago, uh, August 12, 2017, uh, hundreds of white supremacists gathered in Charlottesville, Virginia. You might have remembered the story. It was a sad day, it was a terrifying day. Uh, for everybody. About one year later, on the same exact day in Washington, D.C., a new gathering was planned. But thankfully, it was different for a number of reasons. Uh, The first year, there was about several hundred people that showed up, and this year, just about two dozen. Many were missing, uh, which was a wonderful thing, but one in particular, his name was Ken Parker. Ken Parker uh, was a middle-aged white guy from Florida. And he joined in on the Charlottesville March because he was actually a former Grand Dragon of the KKK. And he joined in the march. He wore a black shirt. He held a torch. And he said the chants with everybody else. The picture I'm going to show you now is just about 11 months later. Ken Parker is about to be baptized by a black pastor in Jacksonville, Florida. His outfit has changed, you'll notice. That's just the least of the change. From a life of hate to a life of love. From a life of publicly disparaging others to a life of publicly declaring Christ. From a life of marching against that man to a moment where he is baptized by him. Yeah, we can... (laughs) Only Jesus can do and change that story. Our theme this year as a church is transformed in 2018. We want to change and be different by the end of the year than we are right now. You see, the ugly things in Ken were made beautiful. The wrong things made right, and the dark things turned into light. And what if that happens here? What if that happens to us? The things that are most wrong, that are most crooked, (laughs) that are most ugly, If God transforms and changes us at a church, what would that be like? That's why we have our theme. And this series, uh, we're in the second week of a series called Transform 101. And we're going back to the basics, back to the fundamentals of how God actually changes us and how our story can become like Ken's story. So with that, uh, turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 will be our text today. I'm going to read the first two verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good acceptable, and perfect. Our theme for the year comes from this passage. It comes from verse 2, the simple command that Paul lays out, be transformed. Be transformed. And then he lays out how that happens, how that takes place. He says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The renewal of your mind. We're going to camp out in that phrase today. When you think about the renewal of your mind, uh, it means something is off. Right? If your mind needs renewing, then something isn't quite right. Something is broken and needs to be fixed. So three questions today to guide our time. What is broken about our minds? How are our minds fixed? And what difference will it make? What is broken about our minds? How are our minds fixed? And what difference will it make? First, what is broken about our minds? Paul isn't talking here about our intelligence. He's not referencing our 
IQ, the degrees that we have, the school we went to or that we didn't go to. The brokenness he's talking about is something uh, a little bit deeper and much different. We're going to go all the way back uh, to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 to help us unpack this brokenness. I'm going to read the first few verses of Genesis chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Before this scene, everything was right. Everything was perfect. Everything was as it should be. God was God, and Adam and Eve were not. And they existed in harmony and in right relationship together. And you see, God had given them everything. Every animal, every plant, every tree, everything was for them and for their life. But one simple command, one simple will, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can have everything else, but do not eat from this one tree. And for a while, things were good. For a while, things were here. We're not sure for how long, but Adam and Eve were following the ways and the will of their God until Genesis 3. And then something changed, and they decided to eat from that tree, and they decided to take a piece of fruit. And the question is, why? Why did Adam and Eve decide to eat from the tree? What made them go against what their God had told them, what their God has expressed as his will, what he wanted for them. My wife and I, we have one son, Brayden. He just turned two a few weeks ago. I don't want to brag, but I'm going to. (laughs) He is probably, uh, certainly, the cutest and smartest two-year-old in this church. He is cuter and he is smarter than your kids <laughs> and your grandkids. And if you have great grandkids, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and we have given him everything. If you walk into our living room, toys upon toys, books upon books, basketball hoops, mini trampoline, miniature golf clubs that he hasn't quite figured out yet, we have given him everything. And yet there's one simple command we have given our son. The same thing you probably have given to your kids. Do not play in the trash can. (laughs) Do not play in the trash can. That's all we want. You can do anything else you want, Brayden, but you cannot play in the trash can. And for some reason, he, he loves the trash can. I picked him up after first service, and he was picking up a black trash can by room 106 and carrying it down (laughs) the hallway. He isn't convinced that I know what is best. He isn't convinced that when I say do not play with the trash can, it's for his best interest in mine. He does not trust or believe his mom or his dad. And there we begin to see some of the brokenness. You see, there's something that Adam and Braden have in common. And it's the way that Adam views our God and the way that Braden views me and my wife. You see, the serpent got Adam to change his view of God. The serpent got Adam to doubt that God is actually good, that God is actually loving, that God actually knows what is best. For if he was actually as good of a God as he says he is, and he actually loved you the way he tells you he loves you, then he would let you eat from this tree. And it's the same with Brayden. Something is off in how he views 
me and my wife. If we were really the parents we thought we were, if we really loved him the way we tell him every night that we love him, then we would let him play in the trash can. And there is the brokenness. Our view of God begins to change. The serpent does anything and everything that he can to change our view and your view of God. Do you think your God is a good God? Do you think our God loves you and cares for you and knows what is best? Think again. Think again. If he was such a good God, then why did LeBron James leave Cleveland and go play with Lonzo Ball in Los Angeles. If he was such a loving God, then why didn't you get that job? Look at your life. Look at what's happened to you and to your family. Look at the pain and the trauma and the sadness that you have experienced. Do you think God is a good God? Then why can't you get pregnant? you think God loves you and is for you? And why do your parents get divorced? You think God actually knows what is best. And why did your spouse pass away? And on and on the serpent will go, poking and prodding and getting us to doubt that God actually is good, loving, and is for you. So why did Adam and Eve Why did Adam and Eve decide to eat the fruit? It's the same reason that we would. Same reason we do. It's the same reason we spend the money that we want to spend it. We date and sleep with who we want to sleep with and date. We hold grudges and do not forgive the way that we want to. We gossip how we want to. We talk trash about politicians the way that we want to for some deeper level. We do not believe, if God even exists, that he is good, that he is loving, that his ways can be trusted. And so you know what we do? We flip. We flip. Say, not your will, God, but mine. I will eat the fruit. I will play in the trash can. And that's just the start of it. This is the same problem in the church in Rome. Paul addresses this in the beginning of his letter, Romans chapter 1. I'll read a few verses, verses 28 to 32. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased, broken mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetedness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. I'm sure Paul could have gone on and on and on. See, the brokenness in our minds, like a tornado going through a city, wreaks absolute havoc and destruction. I mean, you saw the list. Hatred, evil, disobedience, foolish, faithless, heartless, again and again and again. It's our broken minds that is wreaking destruction. It's no doubt that Ken's broken mind led him to march in Charlottesville. It's no doubt that our broken minds caused the pain and the trauma and the sadness that we experience and our loved ones experience. And our hearts long for the dark things to be made light. Our heart is waiting for the wrong things to be made right and the ugly things within us made beautiful. For our minds to be renewed. And the question is, how does that happen? How does that happen? It brings me to my, my second question. How are our minds refixed? How are our minds renewed? It's not about reading the right books. It's not about going to the right school or taking the right classes. Something different. If the brokenness in our minds is how we view God, 
then we need to change the way we view who he is. So the deeper question is, what would convince you? What would genuinely and honestly convince you and change your mind that God is a good God? That regardless of what is happening in your life, you can trust him because he is full of love and goodness and he is for you and he is not against you. This is where Ken Parker's story is so fascinating to me. Here you have a man who publicly and proudly marched, chanted, and disparaged people of color. A former member of the KKK, now a part of an all-black church. I wonder what that first Sunday was like. I wonder what the greeting time was like. I wonder what kind of conversations were happening. I wonder what kind of questions on both sides were being asked. One Sunday, he decided to air it all out. He decided to come clean and tell them everything about him, the deepest, darkest parts of who he was and what he used to do. So he stood before the church that I was a grand dragon of the KKK. And then the Klan wasn't hateful enough for me, so I decided to become a Nazi. And a lot of them, their jaws about hit the floor and their eyes got real big. In his own words, before an all-black church, the Klan was not hateful enough. What would be an appropriate response at that time? What would make sense to you? It's hard to really come up with an answer. (laughs) That's part of the problem. We don't understand. I don't understand, as a white male, what it means for people to march and chant and disparage me because of the color of my skin. In a way, it's like us as men. We have no idea what it means to actually be pregnant, carry a baby, and give birth. We have no idea. And yet, this is what makes sense to me, is that church could have done a number of things that Sunday. The church could have responded in a number of ways, and it seems like some sort of punishment would have been just. It seems like if one person would have taken one swing that would have felt right, it would have been admired, applauded, and most certainly deserved. When we see something that hateful and that evil, we just long for some sort of punishment, some sort of just punishment to happen. A few months ago, I was watching a video involved the trial of Larry Nasser. He was a former MSU and USA gymnastics doctor. Uh, You're probably familiar with the story. He was found guilty of sexually assaulting hundreds of girls. And this video went went viral. It was of a father and two of his daughters had been abused by him. And during the sentencing of that trial, he approaches the judge and says, can I have five minutes with this man? As a part of a sentencing, can I have five minutes alone with him? And the judge says, you know, I can't do that. So judge, can I have one minute alone? And the judge says, you know, I can't do that. So he darts across the courtroom and he gets within just a few feet of the man who abused his two daughters. And unfortunately, the guards stop him. The guards grab him and prevent him from hitting that man. And I say unfortunately for a reason. Because part of me, part of me admired that father. Part of me thought it would have been just if he had one swing or one minute or five minutes alone with that man. When things are so hateful and things are so evil, we long for some sort of punishment, some sort of just punishment to be done. So what is an appropriate response for this all-black church in Jacksonville, Florida? Probably a lot of things. But this is what they decided to do. After the service, not a single one of them had anything negative to say. They're all coming up to me, hugging me, shaking my hand, you know, building me up instead of tearing me down. If Ken questioned at all how that church felt about him, it was answered that day. If he had any concerns that that the church really didn't love, care, or was for him, They were erased. For they knew the worst 
deepest, darkest, most broken parts about who he was and what he used to do. And they didn't punish him. They didn't take a swing. They didn't take him out back and make him pay. They welcomed him. They embraced him. They forgave him. In short, they showed him mercy. They showed him mercy. And on that day, Ken had his broken, racist mind made whole and renewed. My friends, we are more like Ken Parker than we might realize. Scripture tells us that we have clearly wrongly and offended our God. It says again and again and again that we have in our own way done our own Charlottesville-type march against Him. We have defied Him. We have disparaged Him publicly. We have said, not your ways, but mine. What do you think is an appropriate response of God to our rebellion, to our march? What would make sense if you were God? You see, he had a chance to do a number of things. And here's what's so fascinating about God's story. That he did decide to punish. He had to. Someone had to die for what we did. But he decided it wouldn't be us. It wouldn't be us. You see, God knows absolutely everything about you. The brokenness, the ugliness that we hide from everybody else, what everything is wrong, he knows that about me and he knows that about you. And he decided to enter into our brokenness. He decided to actually take on our brokenness and be broken himself on the cross. Jesus absorbed our punishment. He died for our sins. We wrongly and offended our God, and Jesus took on our just punishment so that we could receive mercy. So what would convince you? What would make you absolutely certain that regardless of your life, God is for you, He is good, He is loving, and He can be trusted? The cross will. The cross always will. For there we see the mercy of our God. That's why our passage started the way it did. Romans chapter 12, I'm not sure if you caught it. In the very beginning, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of our God. So let me just tell you, I'm not sure what's going on in your life. I'm not sure the pain or the trauma or the sadness that you are experiencing or will experience. In those moments, we tend to doubt and run away from who God actually is. But we can look to the cross and we can see that Jesus endured the worst possible pain, the ultimate amount of sadness, and the most extreme form of trauma for you and for me. He took on our just punishment and he offers us his mercy. One of the favorite songs that we sing here is called His Mercy is More. And I'll spare you from singing it, but I would like to read a few of the lyrics. What patience would wait as we constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, New every morn, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Church, that song is true. The mercies of God are real and they are available to the weakest, the vilest, and the poor. The Ken Parkers, the Larry Nassers of the world, and everybody in between. And as we experience his mercy, our minds will be renewed and our relationship will be restored. And that will fix our brokenness. Leads me to the third and final question. What difference does it make? What difference, what is the impact of a renewed mind? Let's go to the final verse in our passage. 
Verse 2. It says, Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And what is the impact? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You may discern what is the will, the want of our God. One of the first things I thought about when I read this passage was uh, an old movie that came out in 2000 called What Women Want. If you haven't seen it, don't. It's not that good. <laughs> it stars Mel Gibson. He is a, a man with women issues, all right? He has a, an ex-wife that's causing a bunch of trouble and a teenage daughter, and he's, he's caught in the thick of it. One day he has this freak accident where all of a sudden now he can learn, know, and understand the exact thoughts and desires of every woman he encounters. Whether walking in the street, sitting in a restaurant, in a meeting, or at church, the thoughts of that woman are audibly clear in his head all the time. Men, raise your hand if you wish that was true about you. <laughs> Women, raise your hand if you hope your husband can at least learn something like that. <laughs> when our minds are renewed, we have this new ability to grasp and understand what God wants and what he doesn't want, and to live how he wants and not how he doesn't want us to live. If we go back to our passage uh, in Romans 1 and the list there, the list is describing a broken mind. It's describing what comes naturally to us. Evil comes naturally. Envy comes naturally. Murder, strife, deceitfulness, hate, racism come naturally. But with a renewed mind, everything changes. With a renewed mind, love comes naturally. Patience, justice, goodness, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Mercy becomes natural and not punishment. I grew up playing soccer most of my life my playing days are long gone, though. So I spent many a day, many a night, many a year with this ball. And over the years, I learned to juggle the soccer ball. It didn't come naturally at first, but over the years, I could do this for hours upon hours upon hours. Not anymore, but it's not as easy as it looks. So I have a challenge for you. Go home today. If you've never tried it, grab a ball and a video camera and try to get 10. And then send it to me and we'll play it next weekend. All right? One person did last night and uh, it wasn't very pretty. So doing God's will or doing what he wants is like juggling a soccer ball. At first, it's not very natural. But over time, as days and nights and months and years pass, we will find ourselves oh so easily, naturally, and innately doing what God wants us to do. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, we will do again and again and again. What is the impact of a renewed mind? Imagine a world without Charlottesville. Imagine a world without Larry Nassar's. Imagine a world where God's good, perfect, and pleasing will is done again and again and again. A world where there are full of men and women just like Ken Parker. There is a brokenness that we sense within us, a brokenness in our mind that is absolutely wreaking havoc in our lives and the lives around us. And we long for the wrong things to be made right. We long for the dark things to turn into light, and we long for the ugly things to be made beautiful within us. And so does our God. That's why he entered into our brokenness. That's why he took on our brokenness on the cross. Jesus absorbed our punishment so that we could receive mercy. So that we could receive mercy. And our minds could be renewed 
our relationship restored, and our lives transformed in 2018. Let's pray. Father, we confess to you the ways that we eat the fruit, we play with trash cans, and we do the things that you don't want us to do. And we acknowledge that is rooted in a fundamental wrong belief in who you are. God, the serpent has deceived us into thinking that you are not good, that you are not loving, and that you are not to be trusted. But may we look again to the cross, direct our eyes towards Jesus, and knowing that he is good, loving, because he took on our punishment for us. God, renew our minds, renew this church, transform us, we pray, by your mercy. In Christ's name, amen.